Okay. Um, my name is Chris Munns. I'm chairperson of the Hampton Democratic Committee, and I want to welcome you all to this uh, in the first of our series of virtual town hall meetings with our candidates for state representative. Uh, the purpose of these meetings is to give you, the voters, an opportunity to hear from and ask questions of the five Democrats who want to represent you in Hampton. They are Rennie Cushing, Mike Edgar, Catherine Haraki, Tom Lockman, and Elaine Andrews Ahern. We will be holding these sessions every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. until August 12th. For more information on our candidates and to sign up for the future meetings, please go to our website, www.hamptonnhdems.org, and encourage your friends to do so as well. Tonight's town hall will be with State Representative uh, Robert Rennie Cushing. Rennie was born and raised in Hampton and still lives in his childhood home on Winnicunit Road. He has represented Hampton and Concord between 1996 and 1998, 2008 and 2010, and since 2012. He's currently the chairperson of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee of the New Hampshire House of Representatives where he led the fight to repeal the death penalty, protect New Hampshire's elderly, disabled, and vulnerable citizens, defend victims of crime and domestic violence, and ensure equal opportunity for all of Hampton's and New Hampshire's residents. Not only is he our longest serving state representative, but he is the heart and soul and conscience of the Hampton Democrats. Having served with him in Concord for two years, I can tell you that we are very lucky to have him representing us in Concord. Rennie's going to say a few words, um, and while he's doing that, I'm going to put everybody on mute, and then we'll open it up for some questions. And um, without further ado, I'm going. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and our state representative, Rennie Cushing. Well, thank you, Chris, and I, I guess I want to welcome everybody to my campaign headquarters, uh, to my studio live from my kitchen at 395 Winnicunit Road. We've got the state flag up, we've got the campaign signs, and per Chris's directives, I'm wearing the official Hampton Democrats uh, shirt. So, um, and I'm the first of the candidates to go forward in this media. I think one of the things that's taken place because of the COVID-19 pandemic is that our whole notion of what it's going to mean to campaign and to ask people for their vote um, has kind of been uh, thrown up in the air. We all in the process of learning uh, how to work in this environment. And I'm, I'm pleased that Chris has taken the initiative to host these town meetings. We'll learn a lot, I'm sure, as we go through this process, but it's not just Chris that I wanna thank. I also wanna thank Melanie and Mary and Jennifer for their leadership um, in our town and my, you know, colleagues, you know, Mike and, and Pat and who we're going to miss and, and, and Tom and I'm glad that Catherine is stepping up and I also want to give a shout out and acknowledgement to Erica for being so important to our team Hampton um, activities. Um, so one of the things that this campaign having to operate in a virtual means um, will preclude is me having the opportunity to knock on doors and 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 wonder if it's going to be you know somebody I used to play football with or have the opportunity to converse with folks and tell them stories about yeah I know your house I used to pick the garbage up there when I was working for the town in high school and then you know the occasional awkward moments where it's somebody that you remember what you didn't get along very well with, but that's, you know, that's part of what campaign is. That will not happen now in this. Um, and it's strange for me, I, I usually anchor stuff by saying that this last month on June 14th marked the 100th anniversary of Daniel and Elizabeth Cushing getting married in, Elizabeth Reynolds getting married in Manchester, coming to Hampton Beach on their honeymoon and then deciding they weren't gonna leave. So with this centennial of my family being in town, um, it, you know, it's, it kind of speaks to a, a number of things for me. Um, one, that it grounds me a lot in our community. Um, it's, you know, I, I, I had the great fortune of growing up in a town where I went to school in the same building that my father went to school in. 
and I got to go to school um, to, as a parent in the same school that would to visit my kids that they grew up in, in center schools and you know get to be able to be a, a coach for the same youth league that I used to be a, a you know a player in and that's important to me because it's the lens through which I try to um, approach all the work that I do in, in, in Concord as a legislator. I, I, I can't help but take Hampton with me because that's where I'm coming back to. Um, and But I also have the life experience that uh, takes place. I, I don't have any illusions about, you know, everything being um, totally idyllic in this town and I'm, I'm also, or this state, and I'm also somebody who's very fortunate that in part of my, my family values and, and my life experience uh, shapes me so that I have a consciousness and an awareness of the need to create a society where everybody is respected, everybody is included, that I try to be conscious of notions about justice and equity and make that part of uh, the work that I do as a legislator. Um, I, you know, I, I ha I've had the opportunity to be a, uh, to serve in the minority in the, uh, in the New Hampshire legislature and also to serve in the majority. I will tell you that the majority is much better. And I also have to say what's, why it's really important that this election that we proceed as a team in Hampton, because I want to do something historic, and that is for the first time send a delegation to the state house from the town of Hampton, where all five members are Democrats, um, because I think that you know that will ensure that the Democrats are in in the majority, and will ensure that we can carry out the um, kind of kind of the program that will meet the needs of the people of our state and, and meet the need, needs of the people in our community. Um, and I and I one other thing that I think distinguishes Democratic representation from Republican representation is our accessibility and accountability. I remember back to going back to when Chris served as a as, as the state representative from Hampton taking the initiative uh, that has been that has continued on where Democrats hold uh, you know regular listening sessions office hours accountability where people have an access to commit have the opportunity to come and speak to people and that's what I think uh, you know in many ways this virtual town hall is is modeled upon the kind of the democratic imprimatur, the democratic stamp of how as legislators we try to be responsive to and, and accessible to the people in our community um, as and and I think that when the five of us go to Concord, that's going to mean, for instance, that it will, in a practical matter, it will mean that Mike Edgar will continue to be sitting at the table helping to shape the state's capital budget, helping to, helping to shape the state's 10-year highway plan and making sure that the interests of the people of Hampton um, and the needs of the people of the seacoast are, are represented that they have a, a voice and not just a voice but an influential voice which is part of what the that's part of what the, the is involved in this election and in this race um, I serve on the criminal justice and public safety committee I'm the chair of it and I do that um, in part because during my lifetime when I'm not a legislator I spent a couple decades working with uh, victims of crime, working with survivors and victims of homicide. And over the past course of, you know, two or three decades, I've been responsible for, you know, enactment of some of the most progressive crime victims rights statutes of anywhere in the country. And I've done that working not just inside the legislature, but trying to work with community allies, with people who are stakeholders in it, and uh, partnering with organizations like the Coalition Against uh, Domestic and Sexual Violence. And I've done that for 30 years, and it kind of continued this year. Um, in, in fact, just yesterday, I was part of the bill signing ceremony that sent along to the governor um, House Bill 705, which is legislation that I had really had sponsored originally uh, starting uh, at the beginning of the session, had worked on in my committee for a year and a half, um, had sent that bill over to the Senate, even when the COVID-19 crisis hit. Um, and I was fortunate that, uh, that it did not die um, in March that there was enough of a concern so that House Bill 705 
made it through a process. It was melded together with four other pieces of legislation, but what it provides for is increasing access to victims assistance for people who are, who've been victimized. It refines our state victim uh, uh, assistance law, laws to provide for greater uh, security and privacy and protections uh, for victims. It'll establish a, um, a program to have a, a system of uh, training and standards for victims advocates. It will require the Attorney General's office to prepare a comprehensive uh, statute book or, or all crime victims laws and also included in it is um, melded with other things where the first most comprehensive um, protocol and laws in place to govern sexual assault on campuses. It will provide for lifts the statute of limitations for victims of childhood sexual um, abuse and incest so that they are never denied access to the, to the court uh, to have justice after uh, that they seek. Um, yeah, and it also will, you know, end uh, kind of a scurrilous practice of misleading practice of selling rape kits over the counter with a false promise that that's actually going to have any kind of value when we all know that what's most important is when you're victimized, that you have access to hands-on work uh, with real people who understand and will protect you. Um, I'm waiting for the governor to sign that. Another bill that I've been involved in uh, that's somewhat timely uh, was sent to the governor on Monday and that is an omnibus criminal justice reform bill which uh, will do a number of things. It will ban private prisons uh, which really is consistent with our state's constitutional requirement that a promise and requirement that the purpose of um, you know the purpose of uh, uh, incarceration is rehabilitation and not extermination um, and we're going to remove forever the idea that the incarceration of human beings should be a profit center it's not uh, it'll also require that all members of law enforcement undergo past psychological screening um, for fitness of the job. It's one thing to be able to be proficient and have an affinity to firearms and to be in good shape, but it's another thing altogether to be entrusted with carrying those, to, with, with holding people, with incapacitating them, with enforcing the laws and using deadly force without having some assurance that the person who is given that authority is responsible for that. And it's been a something we've neglected to do for the past 23 years, and I'm glad it's finally gonna happen now. Um, another thing that we'll do is require mandatory reporting for members of law enforcement who see misconduct, um, who see law breaking on, amongst their fellow uh, officers of the law. Uh, right now we have in the state of New Hampshire mandatory reporting for people who see that there's child abuse um, and it ought to be at least uh, a, equally a requirement that people who see uh, law enforcement misconduct be required to report that. Um, and, and finally, particularly given the time that we're in, there will be a, a ban on the use of police chokeholds um, in the state of New Hampshire. And I think uh, in some, again, unique, to the circumstances of the pandemic, this process was not very pretty. It involved, we always, sometimes we, we talk kiddingly that legislation, legislating is kind of like sausage making. You really don't want to see what it looks like, uh, but it, you just, you know, enjoy the final product. Well, this situation, we're kind of been doing virtual sausage making in trying to do the process of you know, taking disparate ideas and, and notions and putting them together, but coming up with a product that I think actually the state of New Hampshire can and should be proud of, um, and hopefully the governor will sign that. Um, a couple of other areas that uh, of concern that aren't directly related to uh, to criminal justice, but I've been involved in working with Pat and Mike and, and Tom, uh, you know, relate to our legislation that was passed that will put into law the uh, standards for maximum contaminant levels for uh, PFAS in our drinking water um, and also provide a, uh, a system, a mechanism by which uh, in recognition of the 
dangers to public health that's posed by, by PFAS and other toxic chemicals, that uh, we have a, a mechanism in place to ensure that there are funds available for us to clean up uh, the toxins that come from, from PFAS. Um, and that was a, a kind of a hard fought battle, but that passed. And so we will have available uh, the capacity for municipalities to start now to clean up that drinking water, um, knowing and fully expecting that the lawsuit that the state of New Hampshire has joined against the manufacturers of PFAS, who for a half century knew that the product that they were putting on the market posed a danger to public health and to the health of individuals and did nothing about it. But as we move forward with that and, and, and hopefully and will be successful to that, capture that and return the, and make the communities whole, make the investments that have been necessary to protect public health, um, make them whole because of the making the polluters pay. Uh, and that's important. Um, and one other uh, bill that I think that, that that's, that that's on its way to the governors and another bill that's on its way to the governors that again, was great having the Hampton team on um, relates to medical monitoring. Um, people who've been exposed to toxins uh, shouldn't have to wait until um, they've been decimated, until their public health, health, till their health has been devastated um, to be able to, you know, receive, collect damages from those who knowingly expose them to toxins. And what this medical monitoring bill that was worked on for a year and a half does is provide kind of a streamlined mechanism that builds upon the existing common law right to uh, recover damages uh, and makes a specific uh, mechanism in place that's consistent with that, that will allow, for instance, you know, families whose children have been exposed to toxic chemicals, to PFAS, to get the it, the entities responsible for harming them to pay to have their public health monitored with the um, hope that uh, er early detection and early monitoring may provide the opportunity for appropriate medical interventions to prevent the implications of that uh, from being deadly. Um, so those are just some of the, 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 the those are things that I, I've worked on that are on their way to the governor. Um, and I will be glad to talk about stuff that I worked on that is not going to make it to the governor, um, but that and that might fall under the category of what I want to do if I'm I'm you know reelected. Um, one of those will be wanting to um, make sure that drinking water standards that we have for public water for the water that comes out of our tap are the same standards that apply to water when we buy it um, from a water distributor, or we buy it from the grocery stores, that the, the maximum contaminant level for all drinking water uh, should be uniform. And it's really important because it's drinking water. Um, and other, other pieces of legislation that I have that, are, that, are, that, uh, that did not do, did not fare as well as uh, I might've liked, or, or we have, might have liked that relate that have a more direct impact upon the town of Hampton um, include and other communities include a restoration of the the state's partnership with local communities when it comes to law enforcement and it comes to first responders and when it comes to teachers um, and when Republicans ran the state a decade ago they walked away from a 35 year promise um, that was made to the communities that the state would shoulder a, a, a portion, 35% actually, a portion of the retirement cost of those uh, first responders and, and teachers. Um, and when they walked away, the, the result was, and zero funded that, uh, it was the largest um, broad-based increase in taxes in the history of the state, because when they walked away, the state walked away from its responsibility, it shifted the entire burden upon local property taxpayers. And it's been a, a struggle that we've been engaged in um, for a decade now, unfortunately, to try to repair that damage that was done 
by the Republicans when the Republican delegation represented Hampton. Um, the past year, we, we made significant progress in that, uh, you know, it, 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 the measure actually, a measure to do that actually passed the House. Uh, unfortunately, it, it fell by the way during the budget process, but it's something I, I'm committed to want to continue to do. Um, and I would just make the observation about something that didn't happen, but something that did happen is that uh, because of the work of the Democrats, but particularly I think from, you know, Hampton delegation played a strong part in this, is that this year's operating budget for the first time uh, in six or eight, in six or eight years, uh, restored uh, funding for the uh, program that, uh, that is the state aid grants, that is the, the sharing of the burden for water and sewer products, projects. And so that, that, with, that has meant that for the first time in a decade that actually the town of Hampton is receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional monies each year to help underwrite the cost of the sewer projects that we've been doing for the past few years. And I think that, again, speaks to the effectiveness and the importance of having democratic voices that are concerned uh, about the community and, and the impact that the state, that the government, that the state's action has upon it uh, will do. Um, and uh, finally, the, the, I, I just, to, I'm gonna segue the, to the other project that I've been working on, um, that in part relates to, uh, you know, kind of a notion of both tax fairness and also in, in environmental justice. Uh, believe it or not, the state of New Hampshire has had a policy in place where it has set up a scheme a half 45 years ago uh, that mandates the exemptions of certain portions of, uh, of projects that the state would deemed to be considered um, pollution con con for the purpose of pollution control and without giving any choice to the local communities just says you will not be able to include this in your property tax base um, and the big beneficiaries of that have been our large-scale power plants including the Merrimack plant in Bow, the Portsmouth uh, you know coal wood plant and, and, and Seabrook station what that as a practical matter means is that Hampton has had taken out of its tax base, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of funds, and it has cost this cost the town again, and uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in um, millions of dollars in revenue um, over the years, and that's revenue that has to get made up by other property taxpayers, and it, it simply makes no sense for us to continue to subsidize obsolete. Uh, forms of, of energy production. Uh, I had got further than that this year than ever before, but I think the tide is turning and I, I'm hoping that uh, with leadership we'll be able to eliminate that. So I, I, I babbled on a little bit and I realize this is a town meeting style, town meeting event. I may have veered into a stump speech. Um, so, but I'm the it's a, I'm the first one doing this, so this is the prototype. And I guess I can just ask if there are any questions. But before I ask any questions, I do have to say one thing, and that's thank you. Um, thank you to everybody who took the time to zoom, in, to zoom in. And thank you to everybody that does work on behalf of Democrats, on behalf of Democrats, both in Hampton, both everywhere. Um, I can't, I mean, I watch the news every night and my head wants to explode because of what's happening in this country. And it is just so dire and so serious. And this election, this election is really important. And we have to work together to, to deal with it, the, the traumatic experience that we're all subject to. Okay, well, th thank you, Rennie. And, and as Rennie said, I mean, if there are, if there's anyone that has a question, um, we'll, we'll kind of do the free form uh, approach just uh, the first one that blurts out you know goes first I see a hand Erica DeFries you want to go ahead yeah yeah hey Rennie um uh -oh. it, it's not it's not hard we'll see um has there been any progress in ensuring that Hampton receives its fair share of the revenues that are generated 
by Hampton Beach State Park to help reimburse Hampton residents for the for the expenses that we're incurring as taxpayers? Um, that's a real that's a that's a complicated question. I will just say that I know in the past um, there's a couple of ways that uh, Hampton number of ways that Hampton benefits. Um, I'll I want to defer to my good friend Mike Edgar, who's been doing Yo Person's work, trying to take the lead to help us recapture revenues in the form of an addition, an addition to the meals and, and rentals tax. But uh, you know, a couple of areas where the town of Hampton does, you know, obviously makes uh, expenditures of infrastructure that have a direct positive impact on, on the state um, involve the work that we do to help promote, uh, you know, the hospitality industry and the collections of, of, of rooms and rentals. And I will say that there has been, there is constant battle in trying to deal with both the cap on that and the apportionment of it. I would like to be able to say that we would, you know, magically be able to change the way that monies are apportioned so that communities that, where that money is generated, uh, will be able to be a beneficiary of that. I think there's a recognition that if you, if you try to rearrange the money that's in there right now, it's gonna be perceived as a zero sum thing and people are gonna lose. What, what Mike has done and you know, he's been supported is try to just recognize that it ought to be a, a, a local option where people are allowed to do it. I mean, the problem is that not only does the state um, you know, capture, capture revenue and not share it with the local communities, but it also precludes the local communities from doing anything on its own that might be able to do. I know I have advocated in the past and done legislation in the past that addresses something we talked about earlier um, that Sonny had raised, and that's the, the matter of what do we do with revenue? You know, the, the promise that was made to the town of Hampton in 1933 at the town meeting was that the state of New Hampshire would take control of the beach um, and, and, and build a seawall because the, the town didn't have the money to build a seawall. Uh, so, so that our ocean, ocean Boulevard, uh, Route 1A could be maintained and that uh, in exchange, the state of New Hampshire would uh, allow, Hampton Beach would be allowed to collect revenue from parking fees. Um, and what happened over the years, the, the, the promise was that the state would have the ability to build a seawall because it could capture funds from people that are driving along the roadways there in the form of the gasoline tax. They take money out of the gas tax, build a seawall, build, pave the road, and build bridges. Uh, the, state of, the state of New Hampshire made a decision that it was going to renege on, on that, and instead of having the seawall paid for with highway trust funds, with high, with you know high, with road basically a road user fee, uh, it decided to take the money from the parking revenue and use that to pay uh, the bonds to help construct and help maintain the seawall. Uh, so Hampton, uh, you know, Hampton ends up having the revenue source that it was promised it would get by giving the state uh, the beach uh, in exchange for building a seawall. Hampton ends up taking having the money that th should be going to the town f in terms of parking revenues going to pay for the seawall it's an inequity it's a, it's an equitable situation i think it's it's very it, it's also tied quite frankly though to um relations that break down between the town the beach the state i mean there is three there are like three entities that don't always work in concert that need to work in concert and i know like some of us i mean pat is pat what we miss is pat is serving on resources committee which um one of the reasons we're going to miss her is because resources does the beach stuff it's hampton beach state parks the, the crown jewel of that and as i know her and mike have been really instrumental in trying to trying to uh, promote dialogue and working in concert uh, for everybody's best interest. And in, in, instead of having the beach have one position, the town have another position, the state have another position and everybody pointing at each other and say, it, you know, you're getting a free ride. We need to, we need to work together, quite frankly. Rennie, um, speaking, of, speaking of state parks, I mean, I, I, I have a question or, or, or a comment 
from uh, a voter in Hampton who was trying to dial in and just wasn't successful, but I promised her I would read this to you. So that okay. you respond. Um, Pardon? She said the state park, state parks parking is so inconsistent. Odeon has 50% all reserved, Jeunesse 100% all reserved, Wallace 50% reserved, but after two, you might get in without a reservation. Hampton South is a 50% reservation mandatory, but pass holders, New Hampshire seniors, active veterans encouraged to reserve, but might get one of the 50 places held out without reservations. Then there's the parking along the wall at North Beach, no parking after 8 p.m. Um, according to Chief Sawyer, it's still light and surfers in the water at 8.30, lack of common sense. And I think her question or her point is, it seems that towns in the state are making the rules impossible to keep up. Um, and um, she says that's a direct quote from the Hampton police officers. Do you have any response to that? Uh, any comment? Yeah, there, I mean, the, the, response, the, the, the response is that on, on March 13th, the governor of the state of New Hampshire declared a state of emergency uh, under the you know, Emergency Powers Act. And because, and those powers are actually rather extraordinary. And that state of, under that state of emergency, he's issued a number of directives that have the force of law. Um, those, he, he has the ability, I, I think, uh, you know, every 21, every three weeks or to, to simply uh, reissue the declaration of emergency and all of those things are in place. So right now, it's actually not the legislature, it's not even the communities that have, you know, say over how everything will operate. It, it is the, the, the process that's been set up is people can make suggestions. The governor can follow them or not, but he signs the executive orders that have the rule, that have a, a rule of law. So, for instance, everything, the, 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 an inconsistency of policy as to what parking may be from, you know, from when it comes to state roads, and, and, and we know that all of 1B is a state road from the mass line, you know, 1A and 1B are, are all the way up. So the state has absolute control over that anyways. And to a certain extent, the governor's powers, quite frankly, can, o can override anything that a municipal municipality would want to do in, in, in its ordinance, should it choose to be. So we're in a situation where we just don't have the authority, we don't have the, the power to, to do that. We have our, our voices and we try to, you know, persuade people to do it. We've got state agencies that are doing the best, but at the end of the day, uh, it's the governor that is making every decision. Um, and that's a little bit disconcerting. Um, I know that, you know, on the one hand, I just alluded to the fact that I can't believe what a disaster our country is in right now because of COVID-19. And on the other hand, there are certain things that I think that we could function, you know, we could both deal with a pandemic and, and have a, a thriving democracy, a vibrant democracy at the same time. But that's, that certainly is, that, that's certainly a challenge that we've been facing here in the state of New Hampshire. And, and quite frankly, you know, there was a, an effort to assert the legislative role in how funds are being spent that, um, you know, the governor took the position that the $1.25 billion uh, that, that, that came to, uh, you know, the state um, to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. He was going to make all the decisions about where that money went, and he certainly has. To, he cut the legislator, legislature out, uh, although there was a law, as I read it, that, that the legislature was supposed to continue to function and exercise its responsibilities even during the terms of a, of a declaration of, of emergency. We haven't, you know, we haven't resolved that, but to the person who asked that question, um, it's the governor is making those decisions. Okay. Uh, Sonny Kravitz, do you have a question? Yeah, I got a couple of questions. The, you mentioned the public employees retirement fund. Mm -hmm. I understand Hampton's share. It's deeply in red. I understand Hampton's share is at half a million dollars and you can't pay it off because then if you send extra money in, it gets prorated across the whole state. And that was one problem. Another one is the, the, the highway over, after the highway 95 to Exeter, all those homes were on wells. What seems to me, it's only reasonable to bring them all online with 
with the water company because in case of fire, where are they going to get the water? You know, the other aspect is, if I recall, Stratum had a, a problem with some arsenic in one of their developments and they wanted to come get the water right. by the water power company, the water company and have been objected. I don't know. So well, I think it's, I, I think it, that's Sonny, I, I appreciate the water is an ongoing, is a, is a major concern, particularly on the seacoast. I mean, Pat and Mike, uh, uh, and I are both on, are all on the, um, uh, you know, a, a Seacoast Water Commission. Um, and among the issues that we're trying to deal with are just, uh, you know, what are things that relate to fire suppression, uh, interconnectivity, um, you know, supply. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have, it's, it's a real mixed bag of, you know, we have got Aquarian, a private water company. We've got towns that have, uh, you know, we got a private water company. We got a public sewer company. We got other towns that have public water, and and, and public sewer. We have towns that have no sewer that ship their sewer to Hampton, um, and uh, you know, again, it's an infrastructure problem. It's a it's a huge concern that we 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 need to pay attention to, and I know that the commission is trying to do its work. Um, but there are there are lots of obstacles there. The the question of you know some of the the conflict between Aquarian interests um, and the interest of you know the communities. Uh, not everybody wants to be hooked up to a public water system. Uh, some people that, that are hooked up to a public water system. The question is who's going to bear the burden for the cost for extending pipes. It's, we've always had a, a thing in Hampton, not just, you know, not just who gets public water, but also who gets public sewer. Um, that, you know, you know, we have to deal with that. Nobody gets sewer on the, on the west side of 95. And, and there are people who are, you know, you know they get an adjustment on, on somewhat on their property taxes for it. They're just trying to figure out why it is that, the, that they don't have this basic infrastructure uh, like everybody else in the community does. And again, it's not just we're, we have that at the same time, we're tied into, uh, we have political boundaries that don't necessarily overlay with just the realities of, of geography. We have a, you know, an estuary that feeds into the Hampton Seabrook Harbor that drains from, you know, Northampton, from Exeter, from Stratum, from Hampton Falls, Kensington, Seabrook, and Salisbury all come into that. And we have a, you know, we have a little, little town by town, um, you know, barriers between trying to make that uh, comport with the political subdivisions with what the geography is. Okay, any other other questions? Uh, raise your hand if you have one. Hey, Rennie, can you talk about how um, climate change is affecting um, the <laughs> seacoast? Yeah, I can talk about how climate change is affecting the seacoast in a number of ways. Um, you know, we, growing up here, we 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 used to have uh, you know hundred year and thousand year floods that are now you know annual floods. We have a, a king tide where um, you know because of climate change, we know that some of us know recognize that sea level is rise. There has been some efforts, I think, um, you know, stimulated in large part by a study that was done by the coastal risk and hazards community a few years ago to try to take adaptation strategies to, to move forward. I mean, that's had an impact, for instance, on the beach where, you know, it impacts Hampton Beach, obviously, uh, because it's a, it's a recreational community and it's also a residential community. So we've got, you know, new building codes that are trying to, to deal with that. But, uh, you know, the reality is we can't, we, we have concerns about flooding and when the entire, you know, marsh uh, is flooded, it's not like you can pump it out of one place and send it into somebody else. But if we, we are going to be in serious trouble if we don't arrest, you know, global warming um, and, you know, you know where I live, you know, it's just, it's a matter of time before many of us here who live uptown think we might have beachfront property the way things are going 
And that that is something I don't mean to be, you know, to make to be flippant about it. But that's just one area that it does is also it's re, there's a saltwater encroachment as a part of that where it's impacting our our you know drink freshwater drinking water because of the, the the rise in the sea level it's coming in to it's having an impact inland on on, on people's drinking water it's you know it, it's it, it's not statistically insignificant so it, it's happening now um, it also impacts the way we think of doing infrastructure how we're going to do deal with roadways how we're going to impact uh you know public structures public facilities as this as sea level comes upon us um and it also makes us uh, uh, to me on the flip side it provides uh, a, an urgency to find uh, a way to transition to a green economy um i've been in, you know involved in, in supportive of the de development of, of offshore wind projects for a while i'm, I'm glad that that's going forward. I'm, I, I chaired a study committee five years ago that kind of uh, led to, that, you know, demonstrated the potential of the Gulf of Maine for a, a clean energy source and a, and a new, uh, you know, new system of, of energy. And I, I, I'm hoping that the, you know, this process began last December to try to characterize uh, offshore wind sites in the Gulf of Maine. I think everything's been put on hold. That's only part of what's COVID, but that's going forward in um, other, you know, other places. And that's part of the, you know, that's part of like a positive green vision for, you know, for New England that I think we need to embrace. Rennie, I have a, I have a question for you. Um, you know, during this pandemic, we've seen how important essential workers are. Um, and it's interesting how the the definition of essential workers yeah. has expanded yeah. to include you know people like grocery workers and yeah. and, and healthcare workers, um, and most of those people are unfortunately not very well paid. They struggle. They either don't have health insurance or it's very expensive. They can't find an affordable place to live. What can we do in New Hampshire in the future to address these inequities? Well, I mean, I'm going to start. I think we should have a minimum wage, and I think the minimum wage should be fifteen dollars an hour. I think it's crazy that we live in a situation that we're in a situation now where, um, you know, for instance, that you know, we need first first response that you know people who are who we recognize are putting themselves in harm's way uh, don't make what should be a living wage. Um, you know, that's, and it's, you know, what, where, who do we value? What do we value? Whose work do we, do we value? Um, I think is something that the state of New Hampshire needs to take a look at it and, and all, and all of our, our society needs to take a look at, um, you know, I was just talking earlier, my, my daughter worked for a number of years. She was at Hampton Beach. She was a lifeguard. And, you know, two weeks ago, there's 83 people, you know, so one day they, they rescued 83 people and you start thinking about it. Who would have thought in terms of what it means in a COVID epidemic to go out and rescue someone that it also, it's not just about rescuing somebody from the ravages of the surf, but also perhaps putting yourself in danger if that person, um, after the rescue is making, if that person had, was positive for COVID and transmitted it to someone who actually went out to save them. And I don't think we had thought about like lifeguards as being the kind of first responders. Um, I think that we need to have a whole larger conversation in society about the different kinds of work that we have and, and, and why we value it. I, you know, I have nothing against, um, you know, hedge people work in hedge funds, but I, to me that, you know, the work that they do is not, it's nothing compared to the people who are bagging groceries at Hannaford these days, you know, without them, you know, these are people who are providing the stuff that's really essential to us uh, as people. And I can't believe what we're doing to, you know, people who are on the first first response, people in our in the healthcare industry, you know, people who are empty in bedpans uh, need to be part of the conversation we have about what, uh, you know, our healthcare system is going to look like that works for everybody uh, because they're valuable. To, you know, they, they are valuable. They're essential if we're going to have a healthy society, we need to re recognize them and treat them with dignity and pay them a living wage. Rennie, uh, can I, if I could piggyback on that one, could we, I think Chris kind of touched on it. Could you talk a little bit about uh, affordable housing? I mean, I think that's fundamental to the economic development that we need uh, 
statewide. It, it, that that's that's everywhere. So, yeah. and I think uh, affordable housing is is a key element of that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, affordable housing, workplace housing. Um, we do not have. I, I'm I serve and I we don't serve. Uh, according to the Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, we need thirty thousand. Uh, 30,000 units, just of rental units of, of affordable housing. And affordable housing means that you, you, know, you should not spend more than 40% of your income on, on housing. Um, and there, I think there are a lot of reasons why uh, we, we have such a, a shortage, but you know, it, whether you call it affordable housing, we, the term of art is, is work for, workforce housing. Um, but the notion is, you, how, how can you, you ought to be, have a community where the people who are your teachers, where the people are your firefighters, where the people who are picking up, you know, your, your, your trash, the people who are bagging your groceries ought to be able to afford to live in the community where they work and they serve you and be part of it. And we need to make sure, you know, we, that, um, that we create conditions that will encourage the, the development of workplace force housing, of, of affordable housing. I think that means changes in our, in, in, you know, regulations and density. Um, I think that, it, that you can't, out, the other thing you can't really talk about, you're gonna talk about uh, uh, solutions to the housing also require <laughs> investments in transportation because part of the, part of the, the, what you need to do is as you, you know, provide for population density, provide for different ways that uh, you can make uh, dwelling, living units, dwelling units more affordable. Uh, part of that involves the ability to people to continue to, to work where they live. And, you know, we just can't have 3.5 cars for each, you know, each dwelling unit when it, most people would just as soon be able to have another alternative. Um, if that make you know, that makes sense. I tell you, Pat, what real, one of the things that, um, you know, we don't even talk. I was going to get into mental health care. That's another thing. But we, you know, we we have a lot of unmet needs in the state. Um, but because I'm on a I'm on a commission, the governor appointed a commission on corrections and um, you know and and, and mental illness. Um, and one of the things about that uh, that nexus between our, our corrections and uh, and um, mental health care. Uh, that both for people who are, you know, un involuntarily who, who have a ment who who are people who who have a you know a issue with mental health um, that sometimes need require hospitalization, and that that results in you know the state of New Hampshire, the Department of Corrections is the largest single provider of mental health care services in the state of New Hampshire. They end up that's where we send people. One of the problems they have in trying to both step people who are who have, have uh, you know are, are in the process of, of, of getting better from their mental health issues um, is gets back to the issue of housing. Uh, one of the things that we you know people are not ready to get real people aren't ready to um, you know how do we deal with over incarceration in our in our state prisons? People time out. There's no place for them to go. It is that it is housing is just such a, a huge place. And the answer is just not to bring you know to set up outhouses on the banks of the Merrimack River in Manchester to make it easier for homeless people to go to the bathroom, the answer is to, real, to deal with the, the, the problem, the homelessness and to see it you know, as, as a problem and to see it as like a lot of people end up being homeless, not because uh, they, th that was their life's ambition, it's just th things happen and they lose their homes and it's hard for them to get, you know, to get their legs underneath them. Just anecdotally, since we, you know, we know that from Hampton, we always used to have a lot of people, you know, we always have people winter rentals here in the town, um, and that was part of like a cycle. It was always, you know, part of what the Hampton population was. Uh, was. And I had a con like a conversation with Richie with the, with the chief, and he's just said the past couple of years that 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 like the winter rentals are not no longer the same like the old winter rentals used to be. I wonder where those people are, but because of, you know, it, the winter rentals have just become too pricey now. You know, I don't know. That's okay. Do we have any other, um, any other questions? Um, Sonny, does, any... Sonny, do you have one more? Oh, hold on, Sonny. I can't read. I can't read your lips, Sonny. 
Hold on, Sonny, we're unmuting you. Sonny, you're on mute. Well, Sonny, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to unmute you, but I can't. Um, we'll have to. Uh, oh, uh, there, there we go. There you go. There you okay. Okay. My, right, my biggest problem is how do we get Mike his cookies? Because he bought my vote of it. His wife's got up, you know. Well, I can't. You know, so he wanted to know how we can, how we could get Mike Edgar's cookies, which yeah. um, is a a fabulous segue to um, the fact that um, next week at this at this same time, Mike Edgar will be holding a virtual town hall meeting. And Sonny, I think that would be a great first question for him. Um, <laughs> how does he get a steady supply of Kathy Edgar cookies? Yeah, I think that's true. So um, I want to. And thank I think it's quite actually. I think uh, a steady supply of Kathy Edgar cookies are going to be key to this fall's election. That's right. I couldn't well, agree with you more. I'll, I'll, um, let, I'll let Kathy know. So, Rennie, before we sign off, uh, any final uh, words of wisdom you want to share with um, with everyone? No, I just swear, you know, I, I just want to say thank you to okay. people. Um, and we really do need to, um, we really do need to run the table, so to speak. We really need to, Team Hampton needs to, needs to roll up there. I, I cannot emphasize that how important that is. Okay. And you know, Chris, we, you know, we're a purple town. If it, they, you know, if if Hampton has, if every Hampton, if Hampton has an all Democratic rep, the Dems are going to control the legislature. If Hampton doesn't have a Democratic legislative legislative delegation, the Republicans are going to control it. That's just that's data. Okay, so um, again, thank thank you, Rennie. Thank you. Um, and. For anyone that is watching this recording who wanted to participate in the town hall meeting live, my apologies. Um, we will do a better job next week, and um, um, we will be having a, another town hall, this time with uh, Mike Edgar next Wednesday, July 22nd at 7 p.m. Uh, to sign up for that session, you can go to our website, uh, which is uh, oh, right over here. Uh, www.hamptonnhdems.org um, and if you're interested in volunteering and helping out um, you should um, uh, go there as well and we'll have some information on how you can uh, how you can do that so again thank you Rennie uh, we're, thanks Chris thank you for all your service we're thrilled that you're running again and um, uh, good luck to everyone Namaste. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, yep. everybody.